Welcome to your Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired. We love God. We ought to be able to talk about Him. Getting you started on your day. With the latest in breaking news and information. From the Vatican to the White House and everything in between. It's serious. It's fun. It's your Catholic Drive Time. Now here's your host, Joe McClain. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God on this July 1st. Friday, July 1st, praise be to Jesus. Hopefully your month dedicated to the Sacred Heart was fruitful and amazing. But today on the program, we're going to have a full show lineup for you today. From mustard seed to the greatest of trees, the development of doctrine with Dr. Jared Stout from the Institute of Catholic Culture is going to be on the program. Also, here's a question. Will the filibuster be canceled in order to pave way for radical abortion legislation. Catholic Vote will weigh in on that today on the program. And then coming up in the next hour, if you can join us, we'd love to have you. Dave Palmer from Back to the Father is going to share what Thomas Aquinas uh, teaches and has to think about all of the headline news today. So, so much going on in the program. Uh, also, 83% of Americans are cutting back on personal spending due to inflation, the poll finds. I myself have been driving like 55 miles an hour just to try to keep the gas bill down as far <laughs> as I can. And there was three, uh, the Supreme Court has uh, asked for three cases to be tossed out in lower court rulings. They involve Arizona, Arkansas, and Indiana, all that were trying to uh, sort of block this new pro abortion wave. So we're going to see how that uh, levies out in the future. Uh, I'm still amazed at how many secular outlets are reporting on Nancy Pelosi receiving communion at the Vatican. My mind is blown that the world has woken up to the hypocrisy that we are all struggling with as Catholics. The S&P 500 fell 0.9 percent, fourth consecutive drop as stocks tumble into the worst first half in over 50 years. Uh, $300 million uh, have been given to Catholic charities by the federal government just in 2022, all for migrant services. Let that sink in. $300 million. Hey, in a another Supreme Court uh, story here, in a 6-3 decision, the Supreme Court ruled Thursday to limit the Environmental Protection Agency's authority to regulate power plant emissions. A lot of people are upset about that. World probably will come to an end, but don't worry. Hollywood will produce a film. It's all good. A uh, Remain in Mexico has been tossed out by the Supreme Court. And uh, Katanji Brown-Jackson was was sworn in. Oh, oh, one more story. Dutch farmers are blocking a border between the Netherlands and Germany in protest of the government decision to reduce nitrogen by up to 70 percent to comply with E regulations. So lots of fun stories. What do you have on your agenda? Well, it looks like Israel is going to start a new parliament. It's the— uh... They can't seem to get a uh, coalition there to save their life. <laughs> it's the fifth election in four years. Uh, what else is going on in the world? Lots of uh, lots of escalation here with uh, Ukraine and Russia. So uh, maybe prepare for that. We're supposed to have a guest I on guess from we, Russia soon. Uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully soon. But uh, just remember, you can't go to Canada anymore. That's not a viable option. Maybe Mexico. You can go to Mexico if you want to draft Dodge. A lot of Californians are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we read that story last week. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, speaking of migrations, Adrian Fonseca is here on the ones and twos. Good morning to you, Adrian. Howdy, howdy. Praise be to God. It's good to be here. Uh, are you migrating anytime soon? No, I'm not going anywhere. Darn it. I like being in Texas. <laughs> Texas is the place to be. Is it? But you know, I heard that we just swore in the uh, first black ever uh, Supreme Court justice. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. that you tweet. see that? That's what, hilarious. What, what, like, it, good this morning, the third America. One? Who was it that did that? It was it like Good Morning America? Somebody. I yeah. forget who it was. And then but they I deleted it was their tweet. It was a yeah. Twitter account. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> like it's like oh. um. Shucks. Hmm. Darn it to bits. Clarence Thomas is conservative, so he doesn't count. Uh, exactly. He married a white woman, so therefore yeah. he's white, clearly. Uh, wasn't Kentonji so, Brown Jackson's husband white? Don't, don't mention that. that? Don't Wait, mention no, that. <laughs> Never it's mind. only counts for Justice Clarence Thomas. Got it. Mm. Writing that down. Mm. <laughs> Oopsies. Well, that's fun anyway. So uh, lots, in the, lots in the news today. We're first gonna, Friday in, first Saturday. That's true. So uh, guess what? Uh, early rise tomorrow morning to go to uh, make first Saturday Holy Mass. Praise be to Jesus. And hopefully you'll be able to uh, make uh, your devotion as well in reparation for the grave sins committed against our Lady and our Lord. Uh, what an opportunity we have, because it's always something we can do no matter what's in the headline news. Is we can live in a state of grace. We can fast and do uh, penance. We can offer sacrifices and sufferings. 
as gifts back to Our Lady and to our Lord. So that's what we're going to do today. Praise be to God. All right. So a lot on the agenda. Please sit back, relax, share us with a friend, but let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your headlines with Rudy Carlos. Good morning. Thanks for tuning into Catholic Drive Time. Today is Friday, July 1st. Here are your headlines this morning. The Epic Times reports Israeli parliament votes to dissolve. Country now heads to fifth election in four years. The unlikely coalition comprised of parties from the left, center, and right united in their goal to keep then-Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu out of power uh, and had in recent weeks been plagued by internal politics and members quitting, in turn making it impossible to pass legislation. The dissolving of the country's parliament coincides with economic and regional security problems that continue to mount in the nation, prompting political instability. It also happens that uh, that uh, it opens the possibility for former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who is currently on trial for corruption, to return to power. The Washington Examiner reports Biden says U.S. will support Ukraine as long as it takes to avoid Russian victory. Biden emphasized America's commitment to Ukraine despite the conflict's economic ramifications on Americans, for example, record high gas prices, as well as domestic political repercussions. He says, quote, the bottom line is ultimately the reason why gas prices are up is this, because of Russia, 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 unquote. Biden said at a press conference in Spain. Biden also previewed another $800 million uh, military assistance package for Ukraine, including new advanced Western air defense systems. In addition to more artillery and ammunition, Biden has committed roughly $7 billion in aid to Ukraine since the start of his presidency. The Hill reports Capitol Police arrest 181 abortion rights protesters outside of the Senate office building. Capitol Police, Capitol Police sent out a travel advisory warning that the activists were blocking the intersection of First Street and Constitution Avenue. Authorities said they gave the activists a second and third warning before the arrest began. And Reuters uh, reports EU countries reach deal on climate laws after late night talks. EU countries clinched uh, deals on proposed laws to combat climate change on Wednesday, backing a 2035 phase out of new fossil fuel car sales and a multi billion dollar euro, uh, multi, multi billion euro fund to shield poorer citizens from CO2 costs. The deal makes it likely that the proposal will become EU law and the ministers' agreements will form their positions in upcoming legislations with the EU Parliament on the final laws. And those were your headline news this morning. God love you. The saint of the day is St. Gall. Born around 550, he was from Ireland and entered Europe as a companion of Columbanus. Gaul may have been of Irish descent, but born and raised in Alske. Gaul, as a young man, went to study under Comgall of Bangor Abbey. The monastery at Bangor had become renowned throughout Europe as a great center of Christian learning. Studying in Bangor at the same time as Gaul was Columbanus, who, with 12 companions, set out about the year 589. Gaul and his companions established themselves with Columbanus at first in Luxel in Gaul in 610. Columbanus was exiled by leaders opposed to Christianity and fled with Gaul to Alamania. He accompanied Columbanus on his voyage up the Rhine River to Brengs, when, but when in 612 Columbanus traveled on to Italy from Brengs, Gaul had to remain behind due to illness and was nursed at Arben. He remained in Alamania, where with several companions, he led the life of a hermit in the forest southwest of Lake Constance, near the source of the river Steins. Cells were soon added for the 12 monks whom Gaul carefully instructed Gaul was soon known in Switzerland as a powerful preacher. Prominent was a story in which Gaul delivered Friedberga from the demon by which she was possessed. Friedberga was the betrothed to Siegbert II, king of the Franks. Gaul was traveling in the woods one day, here's another story, in what is now Switzerland, and he was sitting one evening warming his hands at a fire. A bear emerged from the woods and charged at him. The holy man rebuked the bear, 
So awed by his presence, it stopped its attack and slunk off to the trees. There, it gathered firewood before returning to share the heat of the fire with Gaul. The legend says that for the rest of his days, Gaul was followed around by his companion, the bear. When the see of Constance became vacant, the clergy who assembled to elect a new bishop were unanimously in favor of Gaul. He, however, refused, pleading that the election of a stranger would be contrary to church law. Sometime later in the year 625, on the death of Eustitius, abbot of Luxel, a monastery founded by Columbanus, members of that community were sent by the monks to request Gaul to undertake the government of the monastery. He refused to quit his life of solitude and undertake any office of rank which might involve him in the cares of the world. He was then a very old man. He died at the age of 95, around 646 to 650 in Arbin, St. Gaul, Pray for us. Praise be to God in all things. The gospel today comes to us from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the customs post. He said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. While he was at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat with Jesus and his disciples. The Pharisees saw this and said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? He heard this and said, Those who are well do not need a physician, but the sick do. Go and learn the meaning of the words. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Remigius would say very quickly, he is he esteems lightly human dangers which might occur him, occur to him from his masters for leaving his accounts in disorder. But he arose and followed him. And because he relinquished earthly gain, therefore of right was he made the dispenser of the Lord's talents. Speaking of Matthew there. Adrian, what did you find? Yes, a number of things here. Cornelius Lapide makes the point that yeah, Matthew here probably did not hear about Christ for the first time here. Some people like to make the argument and say, hey, isn't that amazing? Christ just walked up to this guy and was like, hey, follow me. And he was like, okay, and then hopped up and followed him. And Cornelius Alapide here is saying that, no, actually, that our Lord would have already at this point been doing miracles, been preaching, and Matthew would have heard him. In fact, Cornelius Lapide says here, listen to the account of St. Matthew's conversion, which he himself gave to St. Bridget. He said, it was my desire at the time that I was a publican to defraud no man. And I wish to find out a way by which I might abandon that employment and cleave to God alone with my whole heart. When therefore he who loved me, even Jesus Christ was preaching, his call was a flame of fire in my heart. And so sweet were his words unto my taste that I thought no more of riches than of straws. Yea, it was delightful to me to weep for joy that my God had designed to call one of such small account and so great a sinner as I to his grace." And as I clave unto my Lord, his burning words became fixed in my heart, and day and night I fed upon them by meditation, as upon sweetest food. He goes on and speaks further, but Cornelius Lapide here is making the point that these things have been watered, and that the apostles were great men. How often do we think about praying to the apostles? How often do we think about meditating on the life of the apostles? We kind of just think of them as Bible characters and forget that these are some of the greatest of the saints that the apostles were are the greatest of the saints, really, and that we should start having a greater devotion and understanding of who these men were, that they weren't just these, these shepherd men, these tax collectors, these fishermen who were just these random people that God chose at random. But no, these people were, were good men, good men who our Lord had chosen, handpicked to leave, lead a life with him. That's something important to meditate on. That's something important to think about, especially whenever we think about the virtues that these people have, willing to lay down your worldly things. When you understand, when you understand what our Lord is and who he is, then you can lay it down for the greater glory of God. And I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, praise be to God. Thank you, Cornelius Alapade, for enlightening us today. Hey, don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. A Catholic vote is going to be on to talk about legislation. Is the filibuster going away? What's going on with some of these lower courts trying to block 
uh, this uh, decision of overturning Roe. All of that and more coming up with Josh Mercer from Catholic Vote right after this quick break. Protestants like to use James 2, 10 through 11 against the Catholic doctrine of mortal and venial sin because James says, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. But James can't be denying the doctrine of mortal and venial sin because in 115 he affirms it, saying that sin in its beginning stages doesn't bring death, venial sin, whereas it does in its more mature stages, mortal sin. The point James is making in James 2, 10 through 11 is that we must keep all the commandments in order to avoid incurring the guilt of transgressing the law. We can't say to the Lord on Judgment Day, Lord, I only broke one commandment but kept the other nine. So James 2, 10 through 11 is simply a misfire in trying to take down the Catholic belief of mortal and venial sin. I'm Carlo Broussard with the ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. Looking for a Catholic university where the greatest works of Western and Catholic tradition are the foundation for learning, all in an environment that is faithful to the magisterium? Recommended by the Cardinal Newman Society, the University of Dallas offers an exceptional liberal arts education, preserving the wisdom of the past while preparing students for the world-changing futures. Academically excellent, always faithful. Apply today at udallas.edu. be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. By the way, Monday, July the 4th, uh, we are not going to be live in studio that day. We are going to be, uh, I'm sure, getting up crack of dawn to offer prayer, fasting, and penance for the reparation of sins committed against uh, the Immaculate Heart of Our Lady in uh, reparation for the crimes uh, that our country is enjoying these days. Uh, well, maybe, I don't know. Or we could sleep in, Maybe too. grilling. We have options. We got options. Hot dogs. But either way, we are going to have a show for you, praise be to God. In fact, I'm very excited because uh, I'm going to be sharing something that I bet most of you probably are unaware of. Some of you m- might know this, but some of you, I bet most of you probably aren't aware of something very special that was included in the draft version of the Declaration of Independence, but didn't make it to the final uh, version, the, the one that got, uh, you know, voted upon and, and the one that you learned in school. Uh, it's super special. It includes a very strong language against the slave trade, and you might be surprised at who the author was. And uh, I'll share that with you on Monday in this very segment. So tune in if you can or catch it on the podcast. But joining us right now via Zoom chat is Joshua Mercer from Catholic Vote. Good morning to you, sir. Ah, glad to be with you. Yeah, praise be to God. Happy Fourth of July in advance to you, by the way. Hopefully, you're going to have well, a great Fourth of July. Absolutely. I mean, we're going to be celebrating our, our independence, and, and we're going to be celebrating the fact that so many more babies are going to be able to be born. That's a wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah, so. Amen. Praise be to God. I saw an article this morning out of Catholic Vote. Uh, the headline said, Biden calls on Senate to nuke filibuster for abortion. It seems like those on the uh, the far left are even way more motivated than they were before to sh- ensure that they can stack the Supreme Court and then therefore have their legislation. Um, what say you, Joshua Mercer? Well, of course, President Biden, when he was in the U.S. Senate back in 2005 and Republicans had the White House and both houses of Congress, he thought getting rid of the filibuster was totally uncalled for and an absolute violation of the rights of the minority in the Senate. But now that he's the president and Democrats control the White House and both houses of Congress, he thinks it's a great idea to get rid of the filibuster. He's wanting to do it because he knows uh, he has to show to his left wing base his firm dedication to abortion because Democrats are frustrated. Like we have the House, we have the Senate, we have the White House. And how did we lose Roe v. Wade? And so they need action. They want someone to be show that he's tough. And so he's calling for the end of the filibuster because it shows that he's willing to do whatever it takes. But at the end of the day, I just don't think uh, Democrats like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema from Arizona are going to go along with getting rid of the filibuster. And because I think both those Democrats who are, it's hard for me to call them conservative Democrats, they're more like moderate, whereas the other 40 
a Democrats are very far left. They just, they, I think they realize, you know, you're, you're Joe Manchin, you're from West Virginia, pretty conservative state. Kirsten Sinema's from Arizona. It wasn't that long ago that Arizona was a very conservative state. Now it's a purple state. I think they both realize you get rid of the filibuster. You, you're looking at in the next 10 years, Republicans controlling the Senate for most of those years. And I think they realize they have to protect themselves from themselves. Um, because if you got rid of the filibuster now, guess what? When the Republicans take the majority, they can do whatever they want. I mean, a majority, I mean, I, I was just saw, they got headline even this morning. The majority of Americans feel like our country is headed in the wrong direction. Uh, a pretty strong majority at that. So it would seem to me that this November could be a very serious, uh, switch in Congress and if they get rid of the filibuster, that's going to have dra drastic implications for them. Well, you know, actually, it's very interesting. This is, there's a fore foreshadowing of this, okay? So Democrats were very frustrated during the Obama administration that things weren't getting done fast enough. They were trying to get their judges uh, confirmed, people confirmed for, for various uh, cabinet posts and agencies, and they demanded action. And so back then, this was in 2013, Harry Reid was the Senate Majority Leader for the Democrats. He got rid of the filibuster for judicial nominations and, and cabinet posts. And at the time, Mitch McConnell was the, you know, the Republican minority leader. And he said, you might regret this. You might regret it sooner than you realize. And what happened? Republicans took the Senate in 2014, and then Justice Scalia died in 2016, and Republicans were able to hold that seat open. And when uh, President Trump became president, they were able to confirm three justices in the Supreme Court. They got rid of that, uh, you know, Democrats got rid of that filibuster for judicial nominations. Boy, Republicans made quick work of it, and they got three justices on the court that they approved of. They didn't have to worry about a filibuster. Yeah. Um, okay, there's another story here that I want to get your uh, thoughts and opinions on. A U.S. Supreme Court tosses three rulings against abortion laws, two cases regarding court rulings on abortion bans, and a third abortion-related case where were thrown out uh, of the Supreme Court on Thursday in light of Roe v. Wade. It seems like this is there's several new trends here now that Roe has been tossed. Uh, these lower courts are trying to do what they can to protect abortion, at least some of them anyway. Um, what say you on that? Uh, uh, are we going to see that get cleaned up pretty soon? Well, I mean, I think the Supreme Court wanted to indicate a few of them today, giving the chances uh, for the lower courts to handle some of these other ones down the road. And I think that, for example, uh, we just saw a, a local judge in Florida put the put the brakes on their pro-life law, which got rid of abortions after 15 weeks. It's pretty modest. Um, and, and so the, the Supreme Court is not going to necessarily jump in on every one of these examples. It's going to give lower courts the opportunity to correct things. Now, the Florida Supreme Court is actually much more friendly, uh, much more conservative than it was five, 10 years ago. Even though they've had Republican governors forever, it took a long time for that court to change over. So we're hoping and praying that the Florida Supreme Court will use this as an opportunity to, to say that local judge got it wrong and correct the mistakes that they made. Because a lot of these state Supreme Courts had done horrible things. Like in Kansas, they found a, a right to an abortion. And in Florida, they found a right to an abortion. So hopefully these courts will start to change what they've done. In Kansas, a lot of pro-lifers are working really hard right now because they're like one of the first tests after Roe v. Wade. There's a ballot initiative in, in Kansas, August 2nd, and they have a chance to correct what their state Supreme Court had done because they said, oh, there's a right to an abortion in the Kansas Constitution. Absolute hogwash, right? Well, now activists are working around the clock on a ballot initiative, and, the, and that's going to hopefully pass. But here's the thing. Even in so-called conservative states like Kansas, you can never really take anything for granted. Uh, because when it comes to the politics of abortion, it, it can be really awkward. And, you know, sometimes, oh, you think, oh, this guy must be a member of this party. He must be pro-life. This guy must be pro-abortion. It doesn't necessarily cut that way. So we really need people to, you know, get involved in Kansas. We need to keep pressing everywhere, really, honestly. Uh, Mr. Mercer, you know, last time we had you on, uh, we were discussing the uh, the website, catholicvote.org. And uh, you had mentioned that, uh, 
your priority at that time was to to call out all of these these uh, Catholic politicians that were actively working against the teachings of the of the church. And I'm just wondering, you know, considering now uh, that Roe is overturned, the battle is the battlefield is changing. Uh, where is Catholic Vote uh, focusing its efforts now, and what what do you think people need to be aware of? Uh, going forward, obviously the midterms are coming up. Uh, wh what do you think people should be aware of? Well, one of the things that we're working on right now is we developed a tracker to let people know about all the different attacks that are going on Catholic churches. There's 150 attacks on Catholic churches since 2020, and over 100 of those started before the draft ruling on on this abortion case. Mm -hmm. So it didn't just start with this, but of course the abortion debate. And what the Supreme Court did is causing an increase in attacks. So we want to cause, uh, focus attention on that, let people know about what that's going on. Uh, we, we called on Attorney General Merrick Garland to do an investigation. He's been dragging his feet. We got lawmakers on Capitol Hill. We said, hey, you need to get out there and you need to make speeches. You need to hold hearings as soon as you can. I mean, we're in the Republicans are in the minority, so it's harder to do that. But during any hearing on the on the Justice Department or anything like that, you need to press this matter. And then, you know, again, Mayor Garland dragging his feet. So we, we thought to ourselves, OK, you know what? We're getting close to the election. And if your friends in the House and the Senate, Mayor Garland, aren't going to do any, uh, if you're not going to do anything, then we're going to make sure your friends in the House and Senate feel the heat. And so we're prepared to launch very soon a nationwide ad campaign focusing on uh, Catholics in Congress, so-called Catholics, who are absolutely doing nothing and saying nothing about all these attacks on Catholic churches and these attacks on pregnancy centers. This is what drives me crazy, guys. So the left has always said, what do you pro-lifers actually do for women? All you care, you're just pro-birth, you're not pro-woman. What are you gonna do for women who are, who are pregnant? And we're like, what are you talking about? We open up crisis pregnancy centers, we help them with diapers, car seats, you know, formula, whatever we can do. And, and it's like, oh, okay, well, cool. Now we're going to try to shut them down because Elizabeth Warren and Bob Menendez from New Jersey, he's another so-called Catholic. They put forward legislation to try to shut down these crisis pregnancy centers. So it's like, you guys, it drives me crazy the, the lies that we get from people. Oh, you don't care about women. You're not doing anything for pregnant women. We do. There's hundreds of crisis pregnancy centers and now you're trying to shut them down? I agree. There's there's a sort of a nakedness to the evil that that they promote. It's it's just out in the open these days, and it's very easy to look at. Uh, it's a fantastic example. Of, of course, of course, the church uh, manages to get together pregnant pregnancy center or, uh, crisis pregnancy centers and all of the the help, the emotional help that a, a woman might need in that position. Of course, we do that, but it's really not about that, is it? It's about killing their children. It's about convenience. Well, I always, you know, I always say if you go to like a crisis pregnancy center, they offer you free care, they offer you compassion, they listen to you. Whereas an abortion mill, it's about the money, it's yeah. a transaction, yeah. it's about cash, and that's ultimately what it's about. Yeah, for sure. Last point, uh, question here with Joshua Mercer from Catholic Vote. Uh, Left-wing Catholics come out against pro-life Supreme Court ruling. I mean, we've really seen them come out in droves. I mean, they're 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 coming out of the woodworks here. To, uh, to illustrate their lack of understanding of Catholic teaching, their total rejection of it, and Nancy Pelosi receives communion of the Vatican yet again. Major scandal. Major outlets are covering that. I can't believe how many secular outlets are paying attention to Nancy Pelosi receiving communion. What say you, Joshua Mercer? Well, actually, the, these mainstream media outlets understand that the Catholic Church really is pro-life. They do. I mean, the, the, the media gets it, and they understand that when it comes to the sacrament of, of the Holy Communion, uh, it's a very big deal. And so when our, the San Francisco Archbishop told her, Nancy Pelosi, she could not receive communion, that made major headlines. And of course, now that she went to receive communion at the Vatican, the major headlines, they want to say, oh, well, maybe the Holy Father, you know, is okay with her, or maybe he's not, who knows? I mean, but we know clearly that Pope Francis thinks uh, uh, an abortion is like hiring a hitman. He, we know he's, a, you know, the church has always been steadfast against death. I love it that our church is so solid in favor of unborn human life that the media knows, wow, this is going to be a big thing. This is a story. We got a story here when, you know, Pelosi tries to pull something like this. 
So, I mean, you know, yeah, we live in interesting times. God mm-hmm. bless us Amen. Uh, having the opportunity to be here. All of us have an important thing to do to, to spread the gospel of life. Amen. All right, Joshua Mercer, Catholic Vote, catholicvote.org. Thank you for your time today. God bless you. God love you. Have a great 4th of July weekend, sir. God bless you guys. All right, we're going to be right back after this very quick break. We have more breaking news and stories. Rudy Carlos is all coming up next. Don't go anywhere. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Minute. Have you ever heard people say that Christianity is barbaric, that it arose in ignorance? Well, G.K. Chesterton says that as a matter of historical fact, it didn't. It arose in the most civilized period the world has ever seen. It arose precisely at the intersection of three great civilizations, Athens, Rome, and Jerusalem. It combined the philosophy of the first two with the faith of the third. So what's the real reason the opponents of Christianity do not believe it? It's not because it's barbaric and ignorant. It's not even because it's civilized and sophisticated. It's because, as Chesterton says, opponents of Christianity would believe anything except Christianity. Want more than a minute? Visit us at Chesterton.org. So the neighbor who we've spoken to, you know, just in greeting, but who I don't believe has ever spoken back to us, out of the blue uh, surprised us. One day we were getting the kids in the car for Mass and asked us if we were going to Mass. I was dumbstruck for about probably 10 seconds. It was great that we were, had an opportunity to share about our parish and that we were Catholic. Turned out she was Catholic too, and she assumed we were because of the bumper sticker on our car. The Guadalupe Radio Network. Radio for your soul. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. And now more headlines. LifeSite reports Biden endorses eliminating the filibuster to codify Roe v. Wade into federal law. During a news conference in Spain where Biden wrapped up meetings with NATO leaders, the president argued, quote, we have to codify Roe v. Wade in the law. And that and the way to do it is to make sure Congress votes to do that, unquote. He continues, to say, and if the filibuster gets in the way, it's like voting rights. We provide an exception for this, an exception to the filibuster for this action, he said. The Senate filibuster requires that a bill re- receive at least 60 votes to stop debate. With the Senate currently split 50-50 between Republicans and Democrats, the GOP has been able to use the filibuster to block left-wing legislation. Previous attempts by Democrats to codify abortion into federal law have fallen short of the 60-vote threshold. Breitbart reports daughter given father's purple heart found at yard sale. She says it's like having her dad back. Lynn Holloman Bryson's father joined the U.S. Army when he was 19 in 1943, but he was injured by shrapnel in the Philippines. He later endured three hip replacements. Upon his return in 1945, it was believed that the man gave the medal to his mother, who was a New York resident. However, it appeared that it went missing after she moved. Flash forward many years later, and Lisa A. Dabrowski spots it in a yard sale. She was able to do some research and track down Lynn, who is now in possession of the keepsake. The Purple Heart was introduced by, uh, as the badge of military merit given by uh, General George Washington in the late 1700s and is considered the nation's oldest military award, according to the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Justin News reports, stock market tanks with worst first half year since 1970. And the Daily Wire reports, Space is a war-fighting domain. According to the U.S. Space Force, uh, uh, they are activating a new unit within the branch. Make no mistake, the United States Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, said at the Delta 18 ceremony, Space is a war-fighting domain today, and an ever-increasingly contested one at that. She added that she cannot stress enough the importance of the Space Force intelligence for America's national security. Recent reports show both China and Russia have used anti-satellite capabilities. Earlier this year, a telescope observed a defunct Chinese navigation satellite get pulled out of its normal orbit into a super graveyard drift orbit, which raised questions about how the Chinese maneuver the satellites closer to others. Meanwhile, Russia has jammed GPS signals throughout its conflict with Ukraine, targeting the United States Navstar system of satellites. And those were your headline news this morning. God love you. Praise be to God in all things. Thank you, Rudy, for keeping us up to date. You know, um, this this particular session, this season from the Supreme Court, 
seemed incredibly monumental. I mean, obviously, Roe is the big elephant in the room, but the, some of these other decisions, we had been talking to Brent Haynes about them. They, are, they just seem huge, just one after another. And he's joining us now by phone to discuss this again. Good morning to you, Brent Haynes. Good morning, Joe. Praise be to God. Thank you again for your time. Another big day yesterday at the Supreme Court, tossing out lower cases. We just talked about that with uh, Catholic vote. Uh, Kentonji Brown Jackson was, uh, you know, sworn in as a justice on the Supreme Court. Remain in Mexico got tossed, but also uh, EPA got pushed back upon. Tell us about this story. Yes, Joe, this is one of those cases that uh, to a lot of people wouldn't seem that interesting or exciting, that, that it's mostly involved with the administration of uh, government authority through the agencies and uh, really the authority of, of uh, what most people would consider bureaucrats. Uh, but it has immense implications because what happened was the Supreme Court said that an agency, in this case the Environmental Protection Agency, simply did not have the authority to do what they've been, been trying to do for years. Um, in this particular case, it has to do with the Environmental Protection Agency's effort to combat climate change by issuing very uh, far-reaching rules having to do with carbon emissions. Uh, the EPA issued rules uh, regarding uh, especially coal plants and other t types of uh, you, you know the energy producers that they think will um, that they think are um, polluting the environment, and the, this would cause just drastic, far-reaching, far-reaching changes in the energy industry. Um, perhaps change, changes that would cause uh, serious uh, serious uh, changes in the way we're able to conduct our life because energy reaches so many aspects of our life. And the people in the energy industry, and especially in West Virginia, my home state, coincidentally, uh, people in the coal industry said, wait a minute, you do not have this authority. Congress never gave you this authority. And the Supreme Court agreed. Um, the uh, doctrine is called the Major Questions Doctrine. It had never been used before. But basically it says, says to the EPA, look, you cannot exercise this authority just based on an implied power, some implicit authority, you can only make major changes if Congress gives you a clear statutory grant of authority to do that. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are thinking oh, this is a good pushback against overregulation, which has been harming uh, the oil and gas or now fossil fuel industry. And then, of course, those on the other side of the equation are thinking the end of the world is, is near. Um, where does this really land in practicality? Well, what has happened over the, the years and decades, Joe, is that Congress uh, gradually has abdicated more and more of its authority to the unelected bureaucrats in the executive branch and in the what are called the independent agencies in Washington, D.C. So Congress will pass a law that creates an agency and gives it and gives it it'll give it directions to create certain policies and implement you know certain programs and that's fine you know congress can do that that's why we put them up there we don't expect congressmen to run uh the entire administrative state but then what happens is those policies can get vague uh, the, those policies can be you know very broad and not well defined and Government bureaucrats and government agencies have a tendency, just a natural tendency, to seek power. And so, Congress, so over the years, they've expanded their rulemaking authority. This is what this is really about: is their rulemaking authority. And the um, Congress actually has a political incentive to do this because it sort of allows them to avoid re responsibility. They can say, "Well, I didn't do that. The EPA did that, or some other agency did that." And now the U.S. Supreme Court is saying, look, um, if an agency is going to undertake a major policy initiative, it's going to impl implement rules regarding major policy questions. The law has to be clear that Congress actually told them to do that. Um, th this is not some revolution uh, in the way our governmental system is set up. This is in keeping with, with the Constitution, which says that the legislative branch is what's supposed to pass the laws in this country. 
Um, there's, the Congress is still free within its constitutional authority to pass whatever laws it wants and to create agencies and to direct agencies to implement whatever policies Congress wants them to implement. But it needs to be clear that that is what it is doing so that unelected government employees are not issuing rules and exercising authority over us that Congress never really gave them. Brent Haynes is our guest attorney, Catholic speaker, and uh, you know our in-house uh, Supreme Court analyst for sure. And what what a session! Do, would you say that this particular season of the Supreme Court is on at least the top five biggest, hugest of all time? Well, it is certainly notable for the uh, landmark decisions it's it's handed down. Roe v. Wade being overruled, of course, the big one. Um, but also for decisions such as uh, the West Virginia case, where um, it's just, if it's not overruling uh, an important precedent, it's still setting out major new Supreme Court doctrines, major new you know, legal doctrines. Um, so the uh, law school professors and the com legal commentators will be talking about it in those terms, uh, as you described. And, and law students and lawyers across the country, you know, are studying these cases now because uh, the Supreme Court is, in some ways, in the eyes of many, it's sort of riding the ship, um, you know, sort of getting the country back on track in a more constitutional approach. Now, it, you know, it's not the radical Supreme Court that a lot of people think. I mean, the, the Supreme Court went, ahead, went with the Biden administration and allowed uh, – and went with the Biden administration on the Mexico City policy. So it's not as if they're up there just doing what they want. Anybody who mm. reads these opinions, instead of just criticizing them according to the headlines, will see that they are well-reasoned. They cite legal authority the way legal opinions are supposed to. You know, they explain what they're doing and why they're doing within the law, within the precedent and the statutes that are out there. And that's what, that's what good laws do. That, in fact, is what Roe did not do, for example. Mm. And, that's why, and that's why they tossed it. It's funny you mentioned that. This morning I was listening to a story on Gretchen Whitmer, the governor in Michigan, who I think is an attorney. And, uh, you know, she criticized the Supreme Court's decision as uh, limiting health care or, like, hurting health care. And I, the whole time I'm listening to that, uh, listening to her actual audio of her saying that, I'm thinking— if you're an attorney, don't you understand that the decision itself had really nothing to do with abortion itself, but rather with the law and the Constitution and a bad, and a bad decision that needed correcting? I mean, I mean, like, it seems to me strange that people who uh, understand the law, study the law, don't really understand the actual decision that was handed down. Well, Joe, it would be interesting to know how many have actually read the opinion. You know, this goes back to what we've talked about before, about not being able to have a civil, informed debate in this country. Um, these people are, by and large, reacting to the result. You know, they talk about it in terms of health care or conclusory examples of decisions about individual rights, control of the body. But how many of them have actually read the decision and thought yeah. about it as a legal decision? Hold that thought. Attorney Brent Haynes, Catholic speaker is our guest. We're going to be right back after this very quick break to continue our conversation on a monumental Supreme Court season. All that coming up next. Instead of fighting the crowds, isn't it so much easier to hop online and do your shopping in the comfort of your own home? Did you know that you can help the Guadalupe Radio Network when you shop online? All you need to do is shop on Amazon Smile and 0.5% of your purchase goes to the GRN. Just go to AmazonSmile.com and select La Promesa Foundation as your nonprofit of choice. La Promesa is the parent company of Guadalupe Radio. It's that simple to give a little extra help to the Guadalupe Radio Network. Hello, this is Steve. Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question. Is the very contemporary and popular idea that a faith alone salvation, which occurs by repenting of sins and asking Jesus in one's heart, sufficient enough to warrant heaven upon death? No, it sure is not. You see, the 21st century evangelical says, just follow the Romans road, which is four verses snatched out of the book of Romans, and when followed, heaven's promised. That, my friends, is presumptuous. This concept dumbs down the holy value of salvation. So here's your toolbox for Catholic evangelism. Number one, 
the Gospels, nor the Epistles, nor the Apostolic and Early Church Fathers ever wrote anything like this mechanical approach to obtaining heaven. Number two, the marriage experience. After wrongdoing and temporary departure from your family, does a simple one-time, hey, I'm sorry, honey, bring you back into the family? No. Thirdly, the Catholic Church teaches water baptism, loving God and neighbor, which is displayed by consistent acts of charity while maintaining a perseverant hope of heaven is the surest way to God's eternal presence. This is Steve Gleason with Catholic Questions Live. Speed of Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. By the way, before I forget, before we jump into our back into our conversation with Attorney Brent Haynes, um, I meant to uh, bring this up. Uh, yesterday, we discovered that the Mass of the Ages uh, film, the second film in the in the trilogy, which we we interviewed Cameron uh, about that a couple weeks ago. Great film, by the way. Highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. The problem is. Uh, they received a copyright strike from uh, by playing some a clip of some music to illustrate a point, which is according to fair use, by the way. Uh, but nonetheless, the way YouTube works is you are guilty until you are proven innocent through an attorney and lots of money. So they have taken down their video, which had over a million views. And uh, now, but the good news is, I guess you can still watch their film on the website and uh what do you, adrian can you look that up for me the make sure i got the url correct for that i want to make sure everybody has that but it's a it's a tragedy that someone would leverage this latinmass.com latinmass.com that someone would leverage the system in order to prevent this film from being seen by by people i yeah. wonder why that is it was the pope he did it yeah no nah, well i don't know if it was Imagine. the pope but <laughs> at any rate nonetheless mass of the ages and you said the website one more time latinmass.com. Check it out, latinmass.com. You can watch it free there. All right, Br uh, Brent Haynes, welcome back to the program. Can we turn to the Mexico City policy? I, I saw an article this morning that really caught my attention. Uh, I found it uh, very fascinating because, um, you know, there's been a lot of commentary in the news about uh, Catholic charities and their involvement with what's going on at our border. And I, I discovered today, according to a Daily Wire article, that the the federal government has given $300 million so far just in 2022, just this year. We're just over halfway there. $300 million so far to Catholic charities so that they can provide immigration assistance. And then, of course, yesterday we discovered that the Supreme Court handed down uh, sort of casting out uh, the Mexico City policy. What is the Mexico City policy and why is this an important ruling? Well, it's an important ruling because it, again, it goes back to that related issue of making sure that the president and the executive branch doesn't exercise power beyond what they are properly granted under the Constitution. Um, the Mexico City policy itself was, um, was a policy that required immigrants who were seeking uh, asylum to remain in Mexico. Now, we're talking about immigrants at the southern border, but, you know, the, the principle is that uh, somebody couldn't just show them, say, hey, I want asylum, and then we let them in and they stay here for years and years. The estimates I've heard is that it's five years before they even get their first hearing. I heard oh, that just wow. yesterday on the news uh, because the system is so overwhelmed. So the, the policy simply said, all right, you can apply for asylum. We'll hear your case, but you have to remain in Mexico while your case is working its way through the system. And you can see, you can see the rationale for that. Um, otherwise, people get into the country simply by showing up and saying, hey, I want asylum. Um, once they get here, it takes years to get, to get their uh, case uh, heard. Um, they don't always show up. They, many remain here uh, for years uh, without uh, obtaining legal status, without showing up for their court hearings. Uh, so it's an incentive for people just to show up and then a, a, avoid the law and evade the law and stay here and live you know, off the book, so to speak. Um, and the court went ahead and uh, they sided with the Biden administration on this. Um, a lot of these uh, policy disputes of, uh, with the bureaucracies have to do with whether or not uh, not just the bureaucracy or the government agency or the, or the presidential you know, you know, 
the authority extends that far. But it might be that they have the authority. That's one issue is whether, they, whether or not they have it. But the other issue is whether or not they've exercised it properly. Sometimes you'll hear references to the Administrative Procedures Act, and that was an issue under President Obama. Um, the um, Dreamers, for example, uh, some people might remember that when President Obama was in office, there was a big effort to get the laws amended so that the Dreamers could come, uh, could establish citizenship. And there's a lot of sympathy for that. I understand that. Uh, you know, if somebody's brought here when they're, when they're very young uh, and they don't know anything but this country, and then all of a sudden they're told when they're into adulthood, well, you have to leave, well, you, that sounds unfair. You, you, you want some, proceed, some process for dealing with that and dealing with it fairly. But um, – Congress wasn't passing a law, or at least wasn't passing a law that was as broad as the advocates liked. So there was a lot of pressure put on President Obama to use his executive authority. And President Obama, at least by one account, said at least 14 times he did not have the constitutional authority to do what these advocates wanted him to do. Well, uh, the other political party uh, held its power, and Congress never passed the law, and then guess what eventually happened? The president went ahead and used his authority anyway. Um, president uh, Biden uh, has said that he will use his presidential authority after he's had defeats in the courts. So there's a real power struggle between the executive branch and, and, the, and what's called the administrative state and Congress when Congress wants to exercise its authority. And the Supreme Court is there, and it's, it's supposed to be, you know, the neutral referee. It's supposed to be like the umpire calling balls and strikes. Well, that's when it went with the Biden administration and, and said the Biden administration doesn't have to follow the Mexico City policy. You know, I don't want to completely change the subject, but I'm going to do that anyways. The, um, so the whole Supreme Court come out with all these decisions. Everybody's celebrating because it's been like a, a knock out of the park kind of a kind of couple couple weeks or a month or even. And, you know, we have the the Roe v. Wade decision coming down. We have the uh, coming down with about gun control, about religious liberty and uh, the EPA. What what Supreme Court decisions came out during this month that kind of flew under the radar because of all the uh, hubbubaloo about the big decisions? Were there any smaller decisions that are of importance that we kind of missed or maybe some large ones that we missed because of the just ginormous amount of decisions that of, of importance that came down? Well, a lot of that, of course, is in the eye of the beholder. But one opinion that came down that's important for religious liberty um, it's important. It's good that we won. Probably, probably would not have been critical that we lost. But remember, you know, in the law, um, a precedent here, a ruling there, you start building those things, and it can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. And the case I'm talking about now is one that involved the city of Boston. Uh, it was called Shirtliff versus the city of Boston. And it involved the simple issue of whether or not an organization, in this case a Christian organization, could raise a flag on a city flagpole. Uh, the city of Boston had a program that allowed different groups to raise flags on one of their flagpoles, and they pretty much let anybody do it. Then a Christian organization comes along and wanted to raise a flag, and they said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. That's a violation of church and state. Hmm. And the Arguments there get complex, they can get technical, you get into the issue of what is considered government speech, because just as you and I have free speech, well, the government also has its ability to speak and to convey uh, its, its opinions and decisions and policies and judgments, and the government has rights in that area also. So it got into a, a sort of a technical debate about whether it's government speech, whether it's not government speech. But in the end, you know, as a practical matter, they let a lot of other people in, in organizations fly flags, including, say, the flag of the Ch communist Chinese government, mm -hmm. and we know what that stands for. Wow. But they wouldn't let the Christians fly their flag. And the Supreme Court ruled against the city of Boston 9 to 0, 9 to 0, wow. and said that uh, it, was it was just blatant discrimination. Uh, now, Again, and we'll talk about this again, hopefully, in the, uh, in the next Supreme Court term on the Colorado case involving the, the uh, website designer for uh, wedding websites and whether she can do that as a Christian. 
Uh, the Supreme Court didn't decide that Boston case on religious freedom grounds. It decided it on free speech grounds. Mm. And it's, in, it's important for people out there to remember that a lot of times these legal issues that affect uh, freedom of religion are really falling under the First Amendment's free speech clauses. But that case in the city of Boston uh, was, a, was a significant case. You know, it's not up there with Dobbs, um, but it, it's, it's going to go in the books uh, helping to define government speech and when the government can and cannot discriminate against other speakers. Well, let me give you my concern about that, that kind of decision that comes down like that and see if you can allay my fears. The, my fear is that because they're now allowing this, the Christians to let fly up their flag, which is right and just, they may move forward, which the I remember when this was first announced, uh, the satanic groups were like, well, that's great. That means I can fly my flag, too. And I do not support the idea of flying a satanic flag outside of any building, better yet, a, a government building. And so I lay my fears. Why should I not be concerned about this? Or maybe I should be. Well, no, you're entirely right. Um, that is part of the uh, issue in a plural society where we have free speech and we have, in the free speech context, what we call public platforms. Um, the um, the uh, people on, a, on the other side of the issue, and as you said, somebody like Satanists could come along and they could say, look, I want my, my flag flown up there too. And sometimes uh, there's nothing to stop them. Uh, a few years ago, I showed a video when I was giving a speak at uh, my parish um, where at a city council meeting in Alaska, they did have a Satanist come in and say the so-called, well, let's just say the invocation. Uh, it, it, that happened. I've still got the video, I believe. And as I pointed, as I pointed out to uh, the people who were gracious enough to attend my talk, you know, it was interesting to look closely at the video and notice how some of the city council members were just taking it all very seriously and respectfully. I'm mm. not saying they should say they shouldn't. I'm not saying they should be uh, disruptive, but I will. if I were on the city council, I would have voted against it, and then I would have uh, found that that's a convenient time to leave the room. Right, exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, we're just about out of time here. Real quick, uh, I am assuming the Dobbs decision is your number one. What would be your number two best Supreme Court decision this season? If we are ranking them overall, this decision on West Virginia versus the EPA, although it deals with dry boring issues about bureaucratic authority, this particular one gets more headlines because it has to do with carbon emissions and pollution and the EPA's ability to limit that. Um, that that really is a is, is a fundamentally important decision. You know, I would I would put that in a number two. You know, it's hard to classify them, of course. Sure. Uh, but that that's a far-reaching decision that affects government power across the board. All right. Praise be to God. Attorney Brent Haynes, Catholic Speaker, thank you for your time today. We're always grateful to you. And uh, have a great Fourth of July weekend, by the way. That's going to do it for hour number one. If you are at all able to join us in the second hour, we have our game show with prizes at stake. And Dave Palmer is going to be on to talk about what St. Thomas Aquinas has to say. Otherwise, we'll see you on Tuesday. Among the many arguments relativists give to prove their worldview, one is that moral beliefs change. For example, they might say, we used to believe slavery was okay, but now we don't. If there were moral absolutes, well then moral beliefs wouldn't change. How do we respond? Well, we can ask the relativists if we've morally progressed in changing our country's slavery laws. Assuming they say yes, we can point out the fact that progress implies an objective moral standard that our society better conforms to today than it did 150 plus years ago. But if there's an objective moral standard that we've progressed toward, well then morality is not relative. So the relativist either has to give up on the idea that we've progressed morally in order to keep relativism or reject relativism to keep the idea of moral progress. I'm Carlo Broussard with a ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com.
Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question. Is the very contemporary and popular idea that a faith alone salvation, which occurs by repenting of sins and asking Jesus in one's heart, sufficient enough to warrant heaven upon death? No, it sure is not. You see, the 21st century evangelical says, just follow the Romans road, which is four verses snatched out of the book of Romans. And when followed, heaven's promised. That, my friends, is presumptuous. This concept dumbs down the holy value of salvation. So here's your toolbox for Catholic evangelism. Number one, the Gospels, nor the Epistles, nor the Apostolic and Early Church Fathers ever wrote anything like this mechanical approach to obtaining heaven. Number two, the marriage experience. After wrongdoing and temporary departure from your family, does a simple one-time, hey, I'm sorry, honey, bring you back into the family? No. Thirdly, the Catholic Church teaches water baptism, loving God and neighbor, which is displayed by consistent acts of charity while maintaining a perseverant hope of heaven is the surest way to God's eternal presence. This is Steve Gleason with Catholic Questions Live. Are you on the CDT Insider email list? Hi, Joe McLean here. And every week I send you cool stuff straight to your inbox, goodies that you're not going to want to miss. Go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT and get signed up today. Jesus Christ, welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired, I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you again this morning. Praise be to God. We just finished a conversation with Attorney Brent Haynes, our personal, I mean, I'm sure you guys have. We got him on speed dial. Like, yeah, our personal Supreme Court analyst. Everyone has one, right? (laughs) Like that person we all go to, like, hey, what does this mean? Well, Brent Haynes is ours. I texted him the other night and I said, Brent, what does this ruling even mean? And he says, well, let me be short and concise. And he just explains it. I'm like, great. This is fantastic. And y'all spoke for like the next six hours. <laughs> let me be short and concise. Six hours later. <laughs> well, praise be to God. If you missed the conversation, you're always welcome to catch it on the podcast, which you can find linked up on our website at grnonline.com forward slash CDT. That's grnonline.com forward slash CDT. And you can uh, find the podcast also on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play. But I would say that one of the best places I would recommend is just to download the Guadalupe Radio Network mobile app on your app store. So just search for the Guadalupe Radio Network, download it. It's free, and it, it's a great way to stay connected to your local GRN radio station, find programming information, listen to the live local station and as well as get the go into the flyout, and you can find the Catholic Drive Time podcast right there. So, again, search for the Guadalupe Radio Network mobile app in your App Store, iOS, and Android today. Praise be to God. Um, we're going to have Dave Palma here in just a moment, but uh, let me just remind you, Monday is July 4th, and it's the day we're going to celebrate our nation's independence uh, from King George and uh, and England. And if you're not in America, like our friend Alberto, well, we're hoping you have a great day too. And I would be super, we should have, <laughs> we, we should have interviewed Alberto about what is it like from the other side of the pond? They're like, it's called Monday. Yeah, it's called, it's just, <laughs> Nothing it's just happened called today. Monday. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? It would be fascinating to, to sort of get a sense of like, uh, do they? St- I mean, do they still think of us as uh, you know? You like, guys hold a grudge. Yeah. Are you upset we like, kicked I, your butt. I would just I'm really just like to know what the. What, what, what I they just want to that. know. Are you upset we kicked your butt? I, I, that's, <laughs> I, I'm just wondering. Is I'm that, just wondering. Is that like a historical term that you just mentioned? Yeah, it's or? actually a technical term. Te- so you okay, remember yeah, a they, couple days ago, I was mm-hmm, identifying yeah. as a historian. Yes, and I remember. While I was identifying as a historian, <laughs> I remembered the fact that uh, yeah. the okay. the British they uh-huh. actually refer to it as the Great Butt Kicking. Is that what it was? Yes. Let's see. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Praise be to God. <laughs> but nonetheless, we do have some programming for you in case you're going to be in your car or, or cruising down the road or, or hanging out with us online. And, and so we're going to be playing some content that we've repurposed from the past. But also, I recorded a special segment uh, that I think is going to be fascinating because I'm sure, my, if I had to guess, 99% of all humanity ever is unaware of what I'm going to share with you on Monday. So if you know this, consider yourself super special. Joe made it up. I I didn't make it up. <laughs> it, uh, it's about it's in regard an ancient American document. <laughs> yes, uh, gold tablet. Have you have you ever seen that documentary starring Nick Cage? 
where he's uh, running around the docudrama, uh, Ghost as you as no, you say, <laughs> the, the docudrama <laughs> on National Treasure. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, yeah, it's along those lines. There's invisible ink on the, <laughs> <laughs> on the Constitution. So. so at any rate, if you want to know what I'm talking about, you'll have to tune in on Monday or catch the podcast thereafter on our July 4th special. But uh, praise be to God for it. Hey, joining us right now via Zoom chat is our good friend, Super Dave Palmer from, uh, from the North Texas region, executive director up there. Uh, good morning to you, Dave. Good morning, Joe. Praise Thanks for having God. me on again. Praise be to God. It's uh, good to see you again. Hopefully you're doing really well. Any special plans for July 4th? You know, probably go swimming, just hang out with the family, just relax. Nothing uh, nothing too um, too wild. No nothing. summer of rage. You, you're not going to wear any <laughs> colonial garb or anything like that? <laughs> no, not this year. <laughs> yeah. Not this year. That's good. Not this year. Uh, Maybe good. next year, but yeah. not this year. <laughs> That's fun. All right. Um, I, I'm just curious to get your opinion on this. We talked to Brent Haynes about the Supreme Court season. Like, it seems like it was among the bigger Supreme Court seasons of all time. What is your opinion on that? Do you think that this was one of the most monumental Supreme Court seasons? I mean, there seemed to be so many decisions that came down that were big. What say you, Dave Palmer? Yeah, I, I you know, for many reasons, I come to kind of dread the month of June because, uh, you know, <laughs> Pride Month and all that, that goes with that. And also, it seems like a lot of the Supreme Court cases, like in 2015, when the Ob Obergefell <laughs> versus Hodges case came down at the end of June, it was like, oh, my gosh. And they always seem to kind of hold the, 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 the big ones until the end. Uh, seems like we got a lot of wins this year. And, you know, there, there was uh, one on school choice, there was one on guns, there was one on abortion, of course. I think there was one on abortion. Didn't something drop last yeah, week? Yeah, maybe. Like maybe. maybe. I don't know. I, I've just heard, I've heard, I've heard rumors. Uh, but, yeah, th it, this one seems to be getting a lot more attention, uh, good and bad, you know, pro and con. But th this has been a, a monumental season for the Supreme Court, without a doubt. Yeah, gun control, that was also pushed back upon. And yesterday's decision on the EPA, also the Mexico City policy, Brent Haynes put the EPA decision at number two as the most important oh, wow. for the season. Um, so who knows? Uh, pretty big times. Speaking of big times, you're also the host of a, a program called Back to the Father, where you purport you allegedly teach what uh, the uh, the minor doctor of the church, the minor, minor doctor of the church, has to say. You're talking about, I think you mean that's uh, I think that's Bonaventure because you know he's part of the Friars Minor. <laughs> Ouch. Uh -huh. Hey, yeah, this obscure. You know, common doctor, an angelic Obscure, doctor. Yeah, right. you may have heard of him. Yeah, yeah. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, yeah Thomas Aquinas. Uh, so what's on the agenda today for Back to the Father? Well, you know, we, we kind of, there's no real rhyme or reason exactly of why we pick particular topics, but I try to find something that either ties into what's going on in the culture or, you know, we did one on pride and humility when June started and we've done uh, various ones to tie in. But I, I thought in light of, you know, the things that you're talking about and all the Supreme Court and the, uh, the, the Dobbs case and Roe v. Wade being overturned, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, anger and hostility and the threat of violence. And and, and so I, I thought, well, gosh, let's talk about anger and hatred, because there's a huge difference between those two words as far as what they mean. And I think people almost use them interchangeably. You know, they they hate this they they're angry at this but mm -hmm. from a moral standpoint there's 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 a huge difference and as far as the object of what they are and so say st thomas aquinas as you would expect kind of dissects the two words the two passions as they are and kind of think it's it's important from a from a moral standpoint to understand the difference my wife does not allow the word hate to be used in our house Hmm. And guess who the worst I, defender is? I think that's is? a win. You. Yeah. Guess who, yeah, yeah. Guess who the worst <laughs> defender is? Every time I'm and you like, can say I hate, like, you know, mom, I, I hate pizza. You know, yeah, I, I think yeah. that might be allowed. Right. Or I hate broccoli, you know, mm -hmm. but I understand mm -hmm. if she's, if you're talking about a, a, a human being or certainly God, that that's a no, no. Yeah, well, she doesn't allow me to use it for anything. It doesn't matter. I hate, I hate the bangles. Rule the house. You know. Use a different descriptor, Joe. Yeah, that's what she says. You know? <laughs> but uh, Dave, so what about, you know, we're, I'm sure you're going to talk about this today. What about hatred for sin and hatred for those things that are evil? Is that okay? Uh, 
yeah, yeah you, you can you can hate evil and of course I, i'm sure michelle mclean might even allow that in the house i'm Maybe, not sure i'd possibly, have to ask yeah. her but uh <laughs> yeah what you what you can't hate and it, what's interesting and there's a lot of things we'll be talking about and more than we can get into right here is um the the uh, you you can't hate anything that's good in its essence okay so it's not even possible to hate yourself according to saint thomas aquinas mm. you certainly can't hate god that's one of the that's one of the three greatest sins uh you you can hate the truth in a sense but very kind of accidentally it's kind of nuanced but uh something that it would be evil like like sin i i do think that would be allowable uh, adrian mm. and very interesting you know the other day the their document came out from the vatican talking about you know we should have charity for demons and you know it's funny because saint thomas actually asked that exact question and said, can we have charity for demons? And I don't know if you remember that part of the Summa, but he basically says, absolutely not. You can't have charity for them because they're they're damned. Uh, what say you about this whole idea of having charity for demons? Yeah, well, the, the mm. demons are kind of tricky because uh, in their essence, they're good. I mean, nothing that God creates is, is evil because God can't create anything evil. So I think it would be wrong to, to say, I, I hate an angel. You know, I hate something that God created, but you can hate the 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 decisions of their will you can hate their inclinations you can hate their their effects you can hate what they do you can hate the impact that they have uh so i think accidentally you could hate them uh but in in, in the essence i don't think it would be appropriate to hate um a, any creature is to speak about the essence would you agree adrian um yeah Essence yeah, is the, just, yeah, yeah, what the, something is. Right. The essence of something, right, you wouldn't want to hate the – but you. I think you can hate particulars. I think you can hate, like you said, accidentally. Accidentally not meaning – not meaning the like something that you did not on purpose, but something the, the byproducts of it. Right, yeah. right. The byproducts of something. So I think you can hate accidentally, or you can hate in like a particular thing, but not the substance of it. I think that's probably correct. Well, and to jump into that yeah. that, that uh, distinction there too, because we we just had a conversation with Joshua Mercer from CatholicVote.org, <laughs> and um, you know we we're talking about the nakedness of evil that we see today. Yeah, it's just very obvious the way that uh, people navigate certain conversations, their inclinations are very obvious. Um, it it would be the same for us, right? I mean, we're not called to hate those people. We're called to hate their actions and their inclinations. That would be the, the same thing as what you're speaking about uh, in regard to demons, right, Mr. Palmer? Exactly. I mean, Rudy, you're so right. And and this is where I think it's a very practical thing to understand the difference is let's say you see some people protesting for abortion and they're maybe even doing horrible things. Well, you have to make that distinction and say you actually you love them. I mean, you you love those people. They're 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 beloved children of God. You hate their actions. And then that, that, that's the difference is that anger, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, actually has good as its object. You know, most people think, you know, you're not supposed to ever be angry and angry. Of course, Jesus got angry, but so anger is not in and of itself a bad thing. In fact, sometimes it's a good thing. Thomas calls vengeance a good thing, you know, because if somebody mm -hmm. comes into your house and ransacks and uh, attacks your family, it would be wrong to not be angry. So sometimes you should be angry. Uh, the only time, well, what about the, you know, seven deadly sins of anger? That's if it doesn't conform to reason and your anger gets out of control and it, and, and mm. it, it no longer uh, is reasonable, then it becomes a deadly sin. Now, all of this is going to be going into much greater detail on Back to the Father. So uh, when is that going to take place? That'll be one o'clock central time today. It's not on the radio. It's on all the social media sites, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter of the Guadalupe Radio Network. And yeah, we'll be dissecting a, a, a lot of this, you know, like I say, can you hate yourself? Can you hate you the truth? Can you hate God? Um, some very interesting, provocative questions that Thomas asks about uh, hatred and anger. You so know, one o'clock central time today. What I find most often when it comes to any of the big issues, like uh, look at uh, the issue, the debate raging over abortion right now, many Catholics that are coming out for abortion and not even hiding it anymore um, it's like we take we take to extremes. So on the anger issue, I could see people saying, well, then it's OK for me to do X, Y and Z. Uh, but I think it's important to uh, what you just said. If it doesn't if it doesn't adhere to reason, then we, we have to filter everything right. Like not everything should be taken to extreme. 
Yeah. And also that has to do with what you do with the anger. You know, if you like you guys were kind of alluding to at the beginning, if this this you know month of rage and all that. Yeah, you you could get angry if you don't don't like the 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 decision of Dobbs. But if you go out and, you know, set a you know a police department on fire, well then that's taking that anger to the the point of sin. So you mm. have to make sure that your response is measured and also in line with reason. Yeah. Or firebombing a pregnancy center, by the way. You've started a raging debate, apparently, over on Odyssey uh, with uh, the word hate and (laughs) pizza. Uh, And I think we have come to the conclusion that you can say the words hate and pizza in the same sentence so long as— pineapple on it? As long as you're referring to thin (laughs) thin crust. You know, one could hate pizza, which is thin crust, but one cannot hate pizza if it is thick crust because— by default, thick crust is in God's holy will and intention. So uh, it's been settled. I'm with Adrian. I think it's the, the moment a piece of fruit <laughs> lands on a pizza, it, it is open That's game it. for hatred. I Amen, hate Dave Palmer. Amen, I hate brother. Dave Palmer. I can't. <laughs> All right. I'm truly a man of God. <laughs> Praise be to God. Uh, Dave Palmer, host of Back to the Father, 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern on the GRN online YouTube channel and Facebook page. Check that out. Also on Twitter. So tune in uh, via YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook, GRN Online, for Back to the Father and a deeper dive into hate and anger from Thomas Aquinas. God bless you, Dave Palmer. Have a happy Fourth of July weekend, sir. Thank you, Joe. You too. Praise be to God. It's time to play the game Fear and Trembling, where we give out prizes, and that happens today. Call right now, 877-757-9424, 877-757-9424. In Romans chapter 3, it says that none is righteous in that all have sinned. But the Catholic Church teaches that Mary is without sin. How can that be? Romans 3 verse 10 says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. Yet James 5 16 says that the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If absolutely no one is righteous, then who is James talking about? Luke chapter 1 says that Elizabeth and Zechariah were righteous before God. If absolutely no one is righteous, then how can that be? Is scripture contradicting itself? No, the folks who interpret Romans as saying absolutely without exception, no one is righteous, are misinterpreting that passage. They are failing to realize that the key to understanding Romans 3 10 is the phrase, it is written. Here in Romans, Paul is quoting from the Old Testament, Psalm 14 to be exact. In Psalm 14, it says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. There is none that does good. But then that same Psalm goes on to talk about the righteous. Well, if none has done good, who are the righteous people the Psalm is talking about? Obviously, when the Psalmist says that none is good, he is talking about the fools who say there is no God. He is not talking about absolutely everyone. Just so Paul, when he quotes from the Psalm, Paul is not saying absolutely no one is righteous. If he was, then how do you explain all the Old and New Testament passages that refer to the righteous? In Romans 3.11, it says that no one seeks for God. Does that mean that absolutely no one is seeking God? No, to interpret it that way would be ludicrous. Just so verse 23, which says that all have sinned. Babies haven't sinned, have they? Little children haven't sinned, have they? No, this is not an absolute. There are exceptions. So it is perfectly legitimate to say that these passages from Romans, when interpreted in context, in no way conflict with the church's teaching on Mary being without sin. A beacon of truth in a troubled world. This is the Guadalupe Radio Network. Radio for your soul. Welcome to another round of fear and trembling. (laughs) The Catholic trivia game show that helps you work out your salvation by the seat of your pants. It's a 50-50 chance and prizes are involved. Avoid the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Call now to take your shot. 877-757-9424. And now your host, Joe McClain. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time and Fear and Trembling. The Catholic Trivia Game Show, where secrets and agendas are, uh, well, they're shared with you, but you're not supposed to share them elsewhere. So please do me a favor and don't tell anybody, anybody, what I'm about to tell you. All right. Number one, we like to teach the faith. So we look for sneaky, teachable moments in the questions where you will learn something new about your Catholic faith that you did not know before. Praise be to God. And then, of course, we like to laugh. We like to have a good time. And our callers are actually amazing. It's been proven scientifically. And then we give out (laughs) prizes. 
According to experts. According to according to experts. And then we give out prizes, which means we are bribing. I mean, it's a winner for everybody, okay, involved. And today's the day where we give out those prizes. We're going to pull a name out of the coffee cup of divine providence. So, But here's the deal, right? If you're new here and you're really struggling to understand what is going down, I have three Catholic trivia questions in front of me. But we will not be asking the caller these questions directly. Instead, I will ask Rudy, I will ask Adrian, one of which will be correct, the other will be incorrect. The caller will have 15 seconds to make a decision. Who do they trust more, Rudy or Adrian? And then every correct answer goes into the coffee cup of divine providence to win this week's prize. Rudy, what could they win? That's what you're going to be hearing when you put your ear up to this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, actually, you won't be you won't be able to hear it through the replica because what we're giving away is a replica of the I coffee see. cup of divine oh, providence. It's the actual coffee mm. cup of divine providence. Mm. If you put it up to your ear, you can hear the angels singing. Wow. But uh, in any case, we're going to be giving an authentic replica of the coffee cup of divine providence this week, and uh, it's going to take it's going to going to make your your coffee taste so much better. Yeah. Because you're wow. going to be drinking out of an autographed mug mm-hmm. by the CDT uh the CDT team. So That's amazing. We're going to give that away and we're also going to give away a few other goodies. So uh pretty good prizes. Yeah, praise be to God a CDT sponsored prize pack. And the good news is you can save money by buying cheap coffee and just putting it in the mug and it's instantly 40% better. It's true. Scientifically proven, uh, science, according to experts. According to subject matter experts. All the right, World for, Health Organization. <laughs> praise be to God. <laughs> Rhonda, good morning to you. Thanks for calling in today. Good, mor- good morning, Joe. Good morning, guys. Good morning, everybody. Good praise morning. be to Jesus. Rhonda, it's been a long time since you've been on. How are you? Yes, I'm doing well. Thank you. And how are all of you guys? Well, Thanks we are so. alive, and that counts, right? Oh yes, yes, it sure does. It sure does. <laughs> now, do you have I'm any really... do you have any special plans for July Fourth weekend? Um, uh, well, to be perfectly honest, not particularly. Well, um, we were planning to come to your place for the big barbecue, so I'm hoping you're going to be ready for that. Well, we live on the third on the third level of apartments, <laughs> and there are, no, are there is no elevator. <laughs> well, well, hopefully there'll be enough uh, beef product up there to make it worth the effort to climb the stairs. Then, I mean, no, not, re- not, not really. Aren't it, the <laughs> All right. Well, we're glad to hear your voice again, Rhonda. It's good to be have you yes. back on the show. Yes. You, I know you know yes. how this works. You've played in the past. Are you ready yes. to go? Yes, I I sure am. Now I should warn you, uh, today uh, Rudy is wearing a, a, a tie today. So okay, so, you're need so straw. wearing a tie is so you, wearing a tie is a positive or a negative. Um, Joe thinks there's a correlation there uh, between whether the answer so is far, correct or incorrect. Mm, so far, I haven't found one. Uh, uh, it's a blue tie, and uh, interpret that how you wish. But he is, in fact, wearing a tie, which he hasn't been all week. Paisley so. on a field of blue. Huh. A paisley on a field of blue. So there you go. Uh, I'm on your side, Rhonda, so let's see if we can't navigate these t- tricky waters together. We will start with Rudy as is our custom here on Catholic Drive Time. Good morning to you, Rudy. Good morning, Joe. Nice tie. Thank you very much. Thrifted um, it yesterday. Thrifted it yesterday. Oh, the thrill Ooh. of the hunt. Did you negotiate Ooh. the price, too? I think the recording cheering session is cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. All right, Rudy. Are you it's ready? our live audience. Are you yes, ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right, praise be to God. Here we go. Uh, Rudy, can you tell me who is the patron saint of dentists? Yes, fun fact. I was going to name my daughter this. Uh, it's Saint Apollonia. Really? We decided against it. Why? Because a better name would be uh, to name her after the Blessed Mother. I so see. We did that. Poor Apollonia. Apollonia. A uh, fantastic story, by the way. Look it up, St. Apollonia. Okay. We'll talk about it in the after show, maybe. All right. Um, let's see here. Adrian. That's me. Good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, who is the patron saint of dentists? Why? <laughs> see, it's very simple. The church has a great sense of humor. And so the patron saint of dentist is actually St. Dennis the Dentist. <laughs> I'm, I'm mm, sorry. Morning allergies. Because I'm tight. Because I'm tight. <laughs> Sorry. You were saying, you were saying Saint Dennis? Dennis? The dentist. Ah. Dennis. I see. I see. Okay. Uh-huh. Roll well, Rhonda, you got choices. Uh, patron saint of dentist. Is it, as Adrian seems to think, Saint Dennis, the dentist? Or is it, as uh, Rudy suggests, Saint Apollonia? 15 seconds on the clock. Who was right? Who was wrong? 
Rhonda, what say you? Oh, goodness. Well, let's see. This is a wild guess, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but I'm going to look to the left, and oh, I'm going to look to oh, the right, oh, 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 and I'm going to go with uh, Rudy. <laughs> oh, let's go. <laughs> so wise. <laughs> you get an extra celebration for that. <laughs> <laughs> Praise be to God. Masterful, Saint Rhonda. Apollonia. Yeah, masterful. I've always, I've always wanted to do that. Look to the left. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done. Praise be to God. In fact, St. Apollonia <laughs> is the correct answer. Mm-hmm. And uh, who okay. knew it wasn't St. Dennis the Dentist? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not Dennis the Menace. Dennis yeah. the Menace. <laughs> That's cu- that is cute. <laughs> yeah, that is. All right. Well done. You're in the cup. You could win. It's possible. Let's see if we can't uh, double your chances with easily the easiest question of the day. I don't know, Joe. This this might be the hardest question we've ever had. Ever? Ever. Wow. Yeah. Well, hopefully it'll it might ask be. me about what, what one of the Oof. mysteries is of the rosary. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, pull that one out of the file, please. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we're find out. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, in honor of uh, the Supreme Court ruling on the EPA, let's go with this one with Adrian. <laughs> right. Adrian, can you tell me, what is the term... For the application of oil to persons and things, for example, in confirmation or holy orders. What do we call that? An application. So, like, Mm -hmm. they got an app for that. Ah, okay. Mm. Yeah, that would be anointing. You Uh, anoint the people. You anoint the confirmandi. You anoint Uh the soon-to-be priest. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Boy, your answer seems anointed. Huh. Uh, Rudy, can you tell me, what is the term for the application of oil to a person or a thing, for example, in confirmation or holy orders? Application of oil to a person or a thing, like a baby bird or a seal or something? Uh, I'm going to go with intinction. Mm, Intinction. Yeah. Huh. Hmm. Okay. Well, Rhonda, uh, I I said it was going to be difficult, but here we go. Is it intention, as Rudy says? uh, Rudy said it was intention. Adrian says it's anointing. 15 seconds on the clock. Who is right? Who is wrong? What say you, Rhonda, from Houston, Texas? Um, Let's see. Well, I know I am easily fooled, um, but I'm going to go with uh, Adrian. Survey says... Well, well, (laughs) nice job. Nice that, job. That recording's too cute. <laughs> <laughs> did, were you a Rocky fan? I'm just curious. Did you did you like Rocky? Um, Rocky, yes. Yeah. Remember the yes. time he wrestled I, Hulk Hogan? <laughs> Remember that? Hulk Hulk. Hulk. Oh, yes, 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 yes. That was that was with Mr. T. That, yes, <laughs> she remembers. Well played. Praise be to God. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an 80s child. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. Well, well done. You're in for two. Let's see if we can't get you in there for three. This one could be tricky, but I think you got it. I do. I do. Uh-oh. We're going to go back to Rudy. Rudy, can you tell me, or rather, can you give to me the Latin words for the English phrase, Behold the man. I haven't practiced my Latin in a while, but I believe it's oculo homo. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry, one more time? Oculo homo, as in oculo? Eye, like eyes, but look at him. Yeah. Oculo look at the man. homo, you say. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Adrian, you're a uh, Latinx guy. <laughs> mira, mira. Can you give me the Latin phrase <laughs> for the English phrase behold the man well yes as a latinx uh individual latinx. i as a latinx individual latinx mm-hmm. i know the latin word for behold the man and you that do? would be ecce homo ecce homo mm. interesting mm-hmm. okay well Rhonda, you got choices is it ecce homo as adrian says or is it oculos homo as rudy suggests 15 seconds on the clock who is right who is wrong Rhonda? what say you Oh, goodness. Yeah, y'all are throwing me for a loop. Um, like the Houston I'll, loop. I'll go with, I'll go with Adrian. Wow. Cannot fool her. Cannot fool her. No. Not once. <laughs> Two wise. These Houston, these Houston people. Oh, Perfect score, Perfect. Rhonda. See, I think Rhonda's a little bit of a, like a card I shark. Holy Spirit. It's got to be the Holy Spirit with me. Oh, is that so what true. it is? Don't bet, on, don't bet against Rhonda. You're going to lose. I'm just telling I you. I have it. The winner. <laughs> you have a winner. I have the winner. I've been shuffling this whole time. Okay. Uh, of course, after we put yours in for the third time. And the winner is... 
Steven. Steven! Congratulations. Rhonda, you were a lot of fun. Thanks for playing the game so masterfully. You did amazing, and it was good to hear your voice. Have a great Fourth of July weekend. Great. Thank you. You too. You guys too. God bless you, Rhonda. Have a great day. All right, so that is going to do it for this week's radio side of our show. Don't forget, Monday, we have a special Fourth of July themed program for you. We will not be in, but uh, you're going to enjoy it. And tune in because I share with you something I'm sure you did not know about the Declaration of Independence condemning the slave trade. There's something in there. I share it with you. You'll have to tune in then or catch the podcast. Otherwise, we'll be back here on Tuesday morning. If you want to hang out with us and interact right now, we would love to have you as a part of the after show. Go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT to find one of the live video streams. Until then. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. All right, time for you to leave your comments in the comm boxes. What are you doing this weekend? What's on your agenda? Let us know in the comm box if you're celebrating the 4th of July weekend. If you are not from the United States, how do you view? You probably couldn't care less, I'm sure, about America's 4th of July celebration. But I'd like to know that, too. Just leave it in the comm box. Um, uh, let's see here. Welcome back to the after show, by the way. Uh, I see the crew hanging out with us over on Odyssey this morning. Amber Carey, uh, Sci-Fi Mike. Great conversation on pizza, by the way. Lovely conversation. Mike K., Mike Conagher. As long as no one's endorsing pineapple on pizza, we're good. You don't like pineapple? Do you? Okay. So good. Let me ask you this, then. Oh, no. my goodness. Mm-mm. Let me ask you this. Uh-huh. Ham and pineapple, mm-hmm. So baby. pineapple is not is a bridge too far for you. Mm, everything is a bridge too far for me. Everything. I'm a, everything. I'm a, uh, you're a purist? I'm or? a purist when it so comes to. What do you want? Like, what's on your pizza? Pepperoni. Oh, that's it. The, you, just, you said everything, but you don't mean everything. What you meant was everything beyond pepperoni is a bridge too far. That's what I said. Everything. Literally <laughs> everything. Pepperoni belongs on pizza. Oh, I see. The, I only, see, I see. the only exception. Uh huh. Anchovies? The, oh, what? 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 <laughs> Who? Anchovies? What are we talking about here? That's a classic um, pizza. It's a classic topping. pizza. To- although guys, I can't stand it. I think it's disgusting. I think it is I disgusting. think that's an abomination. Too. I do. <laughs> it's a perversion of you God. You guys. Oh yeah. my goodness. The only okay, let me exception. Let me ask you this. Is a meat lover's pizza. Oh, that's okay. it. I'm with only you on exception. That. I'm Pretty with good. you on that. Have you ever been to a place called Dino's in Lafayette? No. Uh, they have a pizza called. Actually, the, I might have actually. They have a pizza called the T Rex. <laughs> Definitely worth your time. Is it a carnivore pizza? Yes. Oh, it's the the most carnivore you've ever carnivored. Okay. It is it is everything you could think of and more on that pizza. The only downside to that pizza at Dino's is they they do like a thin crust abomination. Outside of that, <laughs> outside of that, uh, very good. Now let me ask you this: Would you would you accept uh, uh, a barbecue sauce on pizza? No. And I love barbecue sauce, dude. Have you barbecue ever tried? Sauce Barbecue is delicious on pizza, and you know the barbecue is amazing. I sometimes I'll just get a bottle of barbecue sauce and start drinking <laughs> it like water. <laughs> Which um, kind? Which kind? If, as long as it's made in Texas, it's good enough. For but me. are you a sweet or a zesty kind both. of guy? Both. I like both. Okay. But a uh, sweet would be a, is my is my preference. Is your preference? But um, on pizza. Hmm. <laughs> no. Uh, let's see here. Skyler says, love pineapple pizza. <gasps> Beast. <laughs> Done. Uh, Skylan, I hate to inform you that um, we can no longer be friends. Uh, I apologize. Uh, you, so it's not, it's not me, it's you. Uh, it's not me, it's you. That's all right. I guess I won't send you the samples. Then. Exactly. Yeah, please stop ruining it. Nancy uh, says, I'm in uh, and from Chicago, lived in Texas for a year. Every pizza I had there was horrible. <laughs> Preach it. Preach it, Nancy. Preach it. Uh, Jay Coke says, has Adrian had the thin crust pepperoni pizza? The best. Domino's. No way. 
Domino's has Domino's? the best hmm. uh, fast food pizza, but they, Do they? I, I prefer their regular crust, whatever they call it, hand tossed. Mm-hmm. To their thin crust, but the thin crust is pretty good. It's like it's like eating crack, to be honest. Whoa! Yeah, Tammy Marbury's living it up right now. She is house sitting for a friend, and the house is on the water, literally. It's on oh, literally wow. on the water. Own, own dock. Wow! Watching three adorable fur baby dogs, and the chickens in the chicken condo. <laughs> wow! Wow! Sounds pretty cool. Sounds pretty amazing. Hopefully, the weather's good too. <clears throat> um, traditional co- uh, crust, says Jayco. Thin crust is an abomination of the Lord. My and, mom's favorite pizza is thin crust. And not to be anathematized and milstinated. What? <laughs> I'm sorry, My what? mom's favorite pizza is, is thin crust. I will pray for her. I will offer up prayer, fasting, and penance for her. You have uh, been <clears throat> in my honor. Prepare to die. <laughs> Prepare to die. <laughs> uh, let's see. Pineapple and ham with garlic sauce from, from oh, Domino's, yeah. says Tammy. That sounds amazing. <laughs> so I dare say that's S tier. I can take a lot on a pizza. I like mushrooms. and I Mushrooms like, is the one thing I won't eat. On I like pizza. banana peppers on mm, a pizza. Yeah. I could totally do banana peppers on a pizza. I, I like pineapple as well. Jalapenos. You guys actually yes. don't like pizza, do y'all? <laughs> like y'all it. Actually, Take it. Bring it. Y'all actually hate pizza. Of course, I want six or seven different cheeses. Mm-hmm. You know? That's fine. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Um, I can accept that. You know, uh, of course, I like a, a nice it. thick crust. Praise be to God. And then, uh, and then every single thing of meat that you can possibly think of, except for anchovies. Anchovies is not meat. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Anchovies? Well, yeah, it's, it's, fish. it's fish. That's not meat. Yeah, it's not meat. It's I mean, kind of. Yeah, kind of. It's flesh. You can yeah. eat anchovies today. Of course you can. But you can't eat meat. <clears throat> well, anyway. Tuna fish or on pizza, Jay Cook asked the question. No. Why All right. would you do that? <clears throat> <clears throat> you guys want to hear the most disgusting <laughs> pizza there is? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so... It I'm involves so... mayonnaise on pizza. What? No, yeah. please don't. <laughs> Uh, I, cannot. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot handle this. <laughs> I quit. That's Can what I, they do in Mexico. Do you know way. if you cook chicken or it, pork chops, any meat with mayonnaise on top of it, you put it in the oven. If it has to go in an oven, if you put mayonnaise on the top of it, it will come out so juicy and so good. Ugh. No, it's good. Mayonnaise is disgusting. I double really dog is. dare you to try it. No, it's I, so, I so good. The chicken will be perfect. If you put the mayonnaise on it before you put it in the oven. It could also be perfect if you put a thermometer in. No, that's not true. It. That is fake news. There's no way. It could also be perfect if you just don't put mayonnaise on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Just I'm going to try to watch Dune this weekend. I'm going to try to. I'm gonna, the new one? I problem is I got to buy it and not rent it. I, want, I just want to rent it. I just want to rent it and watch it and well, be done okay, with it. I'll give you a dollar. You uh, have it'll to cover buy. like a fifth of it. It's like, <sighs> why? The new one or the old one? The new one. I Adrian st- showed me the old version. So funny. <laughs> where they, they like took years. It took a year for them to yeah. do these special effects and it looks horrible. Like one scene. <laughs> it took them a year to do like one yeah. scene. Yeah. It's so bad. They spent double the amount they were supposed to. Oh, double? Man. Holy moly. Yeah, he went way over budget. The studio was freaking out, but he, the, the director insisted that they do what he wanted Ugh. done. And it was a hot mess. I would have gotten him blacklisted if I saw if I saw that after mess. a year. I'm like, that's what you uh, worked on? Uh, raise your hand if you've seen the old Dune and if you've seen the new Dune and let us know your thoughts between the two in the comm box. How do we know, know if they're raising their hands? Uh, well, they'll be commenting. That's no. You can emoji. Dynamic equivalent. Comment an emoji raising <clears throat> hand. You surely could. Skyland said, Mexican food all day. <gasps> all right. All right, Skyland. You're back in my good graces now that you've said Mexican food all the way. <laughs> Bar you, pizza. You have now, I welcome Laura. you back Bar to the team. Pizza. Uh, talking about abominations, I hope it doesn't become a thing, but ice cream on pizza. It was from an episode of of Miss Marvel. Uh, that was Damon over on on uh, hmm. on the Facebooks. Uh, Miss Marvel, the uh, TV show about the Muslim superhero. That Interesting. One? Interesting. Lori says, mayonnaise on pizza, barf. Yes, <laughs> indeed. That is literal cancer. <laughs> <laughs> and burn the roof of your mouth on the first bite every time. Italian sausage and green peppers. Thin crust New Jersey pizza. Oh, What? Thin crust? No. 
It's not God's, God's holy intention for thin I crust. I don't mind thin crust, by the way. What? <clears throat> yeah, how did I hire you exactly? I should have asked these questions during the interview. My requirement for pizza, though, mm -hmm. if I really, really want pizza, it's got to be wood fired. Oh. That's where I met my wife at a wood fired pizza place. We must return to yeah. tradition. Bertucci's Pizzeria in Nashua, New Hampshire is where I met Michelle. Bertucci's. Yep. Bertucci's. And they did wood fired pizza. So good. It was so good. Yeah, it was nice. I was doing a live remote broadcast from there, hawking pizzas over the radio. <laughs> and she walked in, and then I heard, oh. oh. And it was the microphone. Uh, it was, it was like <laughs> it was giving feed feedback. It was feedback like, on what? the microphone. But I interpreted it to mean something different. And here we are, all these 20, 20 million years one, two, later, three. 20 plus years later. Praise be to God. I'm terrified right Just now. Just think of, ah, man, pizza's so magical. It brings people together. Oh, man. It makes me hungry. I want to go get pizza right now. I want pizza, too, but it's Friday. It's and Friday. Then... Cheese pizza. Full of cheese. Cheese. Go cheese, man. Cheese with pineapple and well, here's uh, the thing, mushrooms right? and peppers. All right. All here's right. the thing, right? We get up We get up early, so by the time we're done with the show, it's basically lunch lunchtime for, for us. us yeah. But nothing is open around us nope. until, like, 10. Uh, today, especially, it's like past lunchtime for me because Maria decided to wake up at three in the morning for some reason. And uh, so, yeah, I would love to get pizza, but I don't want to wait till 10 p.m. 10 a.m. I mean, <laughs> wait for them to open. This morning, I saw this video flying around the Internet of some guy probably in like India or Sri Lanka or Pakistan or something. And he's coming around Pakistan. the corner of this building. Wearing, I mean, can I, can, can you, can you grab my screen share? Let me, let me see one second. It's so hilarious. I, it's, I forget that I'm live streaming and not on radio so I can show you and not tell you. So let's see if, see if we can uh, get this, get this done. This is hilarious. You guys, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but it was so, it All gave right. me such a good laugh. You're good. So this is a video. Can you guys see this? See what he's doing there? He's doing the, the fashion week walk. But Rudy, he's, is that you? What am I looking at? He's, Hang on, let me. What is that? <laughs> he's doing he's doing the fashion week walk. You know how you see those videos of <laughs> Yikes. wearing the weirdest things. Wearing the, absolutely <laughs> both bizarre. I bet you someone's gonna I bet you one of these uh, so-called uh, artists. <laughs> Are gonna turn all these things into <laughs> actual a, dresses. It's, it's oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people that should dress like that. The last one. That was so funny. I just couldn't. I don't know what it. you're laughing at, Joe. It's this so is hilarious. functional clothing. <laughs> <laughs> who like what pretentious nonsense do you I'm mean, like, who thinks that Wearing the most absurd clothing ever is like, how do these people make a living? I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. It's uh, so not in keeping with reality and common sense, but none. Skyline says, breathe, Joe, breathe. It was funny. It was hilarious. I got a good laugh anyway. Uh, barbecue is tainted ketchup, says Sci-Fi Mike. What? Oh, oh, so Mike. Good. Where are you from? Bob barbecue. <laughs> you clearly hate all that is good and true and beautiful in the world. <laughs> Barbecue is the nectar of the gods. That's why. I, that's why <laughs> I drink it. Of the gods. That's why I drink it by the bottle. In Petrus, fact, every morning, morning I have you. a bottle of barbecue yeah. that I consume every morning before yeah, work. I see. Uh, it's a lot morning. of calories. So I was gonna say. What what variation do you get? Uh... Yeah. You know, I make sure I go to Bucky's. <laughs> and I get the, uh, you the, get the sampler. And I, no, no. I get the Bucky's barbecue. Yeah. Um, but also, fun fact about Bucky's, they also sell some local uh, barbecue sauces that are made by uh, you know local folk. Get behind me, Satan, man. Because <laughs> uh, chopped brisket sandwich sounds amazing. <clears throat> yeah, it does. Mm, I like their uh, I like their sliced potato chips. Oh yeah, those are good. Actually, quite good. Clarissa, hanging out with us on the Rumbles this morning. So is Kendrickson. Good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, Clarissa says, she's the cutest, sweetest thing. One of my fave callers on the game show. Speaking of Rhonda, uh, our contestant is I today. I think they just talk about me. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. I see. Um, good morning to you guys. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Praise be to God. Um, Petrus joined us on uh, Odyssey. He oh. says, my bad. I had to go fix a tractor. What? Wow. I'm jealous. Excuses. That's cool. So jealous. Fixing a tractor what kind of tractor was it, by the way? What, what, I mean, we're talking John Deere it's here. It's a John Deere, I bet. Coda. I'm mean, like, what are we 
Lamborghini. Do you know Lamborghini is it a, started is it a John in the Doe? business? Do you, are you, do you drive a John Doe? What, oh. what about a John 316? Do you drive a John 316? <laughs> I'm just wondering. Just wondering. Beer is proof God loves us and wants us to be happy, but barbecue sauce is pretty awesome. Says Mike K. You know, the uh, I forget who, what saint it was. One of the saints said, um, we should we we should thank God for for alcohol by not drinking too much of it. And I think that's a it's a good co- quote. Mike, what do you think about IPAs? They are disgusting. I didn't I asked Mike. <laughs> They're gross. We know what you think about IPAs. IPAs are the literally just garbage. <laughs> and people would pretend to like them. Uh, Damon says, Bad "Old liars. Dune was funny and cheesy. No one was, no one was okay. It wasn't great to me. It's a long movie for not much to happen story-wise. Mm. Are you referring to the new one or the old one? That last bit there, Damon. Is it too long in the new one, or is the old one just too long? The old one was pretty long, I think." Mike said, "IPA is not beer." So true, Mike. So true. Yeah, IPAs, uh, Indian Pale Ale. I was uh, I did an interview last night with Trevor, who is the uh, founder. Trevor of, Noah? No, uh, <laughs> with Tridentine <laughs> Brewing, and he uh, we talked about IPAs for a while, and he was saying, "Look, I get it. People don't like IPAs, but you got to understand the historical context. IPAs were made because the British were sending beer all the way to India, and beer would go bad on how long it would take to get from Britain." Mm. to India, so they shoved it with a ton of bitterance with a bunch of hops because they are like, okay, if we fill it with as much hops as we can, then it'll be preserved and it'll still be drinkable when we get there. But my argument is, is it really drinkable? <laughs> is it really drinkable? I'm not convinced. Uh, Dave Palmer says, IPAs is what happens when beer reaches its perfection. See, Dave. it's either it's there's like two extremes. Whoa, there's fakeness. nothing in between. It's Whoa. very very strange. It's fake. I I've tasted one IPA that I really enjoyed. That's about it though. What one was that? Uh, let me look it up. I think it's called. Uh, let me see. Have you ever had Dragon's Breath? No. No. It's chocolate beer. Interesting. It is interesting. It's very good, actually. Rudy's like, uh, yeah, it was really strange. That one IPA I liked. It was delicious, but it was the tenth beer I had that day. <laughs> uh, no, it's been a while since that happened. But um, here it is. It's made by Lagunitas. It's called Super Cluster, a citra hopped mega IPA of intergalactic proportions. Cypher wow. Mike will like that one. Intergalactic. <laughs> That's intergalactic. great. For Shannon says, I love the bitterness of a lot of hops. Jay Coke says, Dragon Breath equal beer plus rotten milk. Yikes. Is it actually? No. Like, you know, I've, I might. It's possible. I wonder if it's uh, like it? a genetic thing, right? Because some people think um, cilantro tastes like soap. Really? I wonder if it's just like a genetic thing. You, some people mm-hmm. like IPAs, some mm-hmm. people don't. I don't know. I think everybody who likes IPAs are just are just liars. I'm just saying. <laughs> wow. Sorry, Dave. I'll tell you, th- I'll Dave tell you. Palmer a liar. Yep. I'll tell you this. Yep. You know, um, I wouldn't drink is that one exclusively. Is vengeance okay when you're being called out as a liar? Is vengeance oh, okay under the circumstances? Let me know, Dave Palmer. Yeah. Am I calumniating you? <clears throat> Let me know. Yeah. Calumniating. Um, interesting. Praise be to God. Christopher Velasquez, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Amber says, Ome Gang makes an IPA that they describe as being a gateway IPA. What? There's a knockoff Bucky's in Illinois called Ricky Rockets. That's I would go cool. there. Come on. I got to look that That's up. That's racist. I gotta Ricky that Rockets. Ricky... That's cultural appropriation. I don't appreciate it. It's not cool. Rock, rock. See, Forrest, Forrest Shannon says cilantro is awful. Probably tastes like soap to you, right, Forrest? Jay Coke says, Dave Palmer, do you mean Hefenweizen? Amen, brother. Hefenweizen. Hefenweizen is uh, my favorite beer. So good. <laughs> it's very good. Much better. Huh. Much better. Hefenweizen is my least favorite. It's just, really? It just tastes like nothing. What? <laughs> Dude. It tastes like nothing. What? What's wrong with you? I'm so I'm so disappointed. Um, Dave says hate of IPA does not conform with right reason, but Adrian, at least we agree about pineapple on pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, I need you to tell me. Give me a Texas IPA that uh, that you like, that is actually disgusting, but you like for some reason, and I will try it. Let's go get, get a super you. cluster. Nancy, Ricky Rockets cannot be an actual knockoff of Bucky's. Okay, there's only a handful of pumps on that station. 
Rick, uh, Bucky's <laughs> has a hundred pumps. Must make Squid makes it a knockoff. That's true. Like, it's not even close to being the same. It's like getting something off of Wish. It's like the most American thing I've ever seen, to be honest with you. It's a very Texas thing. I mean, the store... It is very Texas. The Ricky Rocket store is about as big as the bathrooms at Bucky's. <laughs> so, although interesting, I don't think this qualifies as a knockoff. Jay Coke says, what, uh, the cider. Or, no, no, Yvonne said apple beer. And so Jay Coke you mean, said, you mean cider? Yes, cider is really good. I actually, I don't like apple juice. And so I was like, yeah, I won't like cider. And so I uh, I tried cider for the first time because the TFP make their own cider and their their headquarters in, in uh, Pennsylvania. And they brought some over for Thanksgiving one year. And I tried it and it was like, whoa, this stuff is pretty darn good. And so they yeah. converted me to uh, liking cider. Okay, Adrian, you get invited to the love of your life, like your ultra mega crush. Okay. To her barbecue. All right. She's like, Adrian... I just want to have a good time. You want to come over? Yeah. Uh, oh, we. My dad was supposed to grill, but actually he's sick. Can you grill? And Yikes. then you're like, okay, That's of too course. Much pressure. I go, and then you open the door, mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, hey, uh, I've got a little parched. And she's like, oh, all I have is IPA. Is that okay? Is the relationship over? Nope, but I won't drink the IPA. <laughs> I'd be like, all right. Um, I'm just gonna, just gonna. Have a little bit of a toilet water instead. Um, Rudy, be better. <laughs> uh, I, I missed it. I was not paying attention. Who is his mega crush? I don't know. Oh, I don't think she exists. Oh, I see. That would be not in this place. It was a hypothetical. That would hypothetical. be the you weren't naming Mary. names. Okay, I'm no. sorry. It was who? That'd be the Blessed Virgin Mary. <laughs> the Blessed Virgin Mary. Nice save. Well done. But um, the Blessed Virgin Master doesn't Baker. like IPAs. She told me. <laughs> Master Baker says half a wizen water. Bruh. <laughs> Bruh. You haven't had the right uh, Heffenweizen then. They're they're better. You know, me and my buddy Sean actually brewed some uh, Heffenweizen a couple years ago. Uh, actually, 20, 2020, we brewed a case of Heffenweizen, and it came out so bad. It was so <laughs> bad. It was like it was like super sour, and we we're like, what did we do wrong? Why does this IPA. taste like this? <laughs> it was so bad. I was like, how did we do this? So, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, favorite beer, beer of all time. Favorite, favorite beer of all time. Favorite beer of all time. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there's, I think there's BJ's here in, in, yeah, uh, yeah, in, there is. in Texas, right? BJ's makes a, um, it's like a restaurant, like a bar restaurant. They make a slash brewery. They make a porter. It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Nice Poli chocolatey Ooh. porter. Poli yeah, that Chicho sounds yummy, says actually. he likes Carbach. Poli Chicho. Poli Chicho. <laughs> he likes what? He likes Carbach. It's a local Car brew. Oh, Carbach. Carbach. Yeah. Local brew. Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, Nancy says, I like Adrian's crush's voice as done by Rudy. Yeah, if my... Uh, if her, <laughs> Adrian. If it turns out that <laughs> that's... She talk like if that? her voice sounds like that... She that would, be, would be a deal breaker. <laughs> that would be a what? deal breaker. <laughs> what if she had a bad laugh? Like, uh, like an annoying laugh. Um, I guess it depends on how bad it is. Lori <laughs> says, that the rest of your life. Lori says, hopefully my son will smoke the fatted pig Ooh. and we will feast and have watermelon and bluebell Dutch chocolate ice cream. We're going to need samples, Lori. I'm going to need samples for the, for the pig. Lori, Oof. Lori, I hate to break it to you, but last time I had bluebell, I looked at the ingredients, high fructose corn syrup. Don't care. Yeah. I thought this was like the tip top S tier, yeah. like mega yeah. super cool. Yeah. Yeah. Ice cream. It had fructo high fructose corn syrup. Fructus. Yeah. Don't care. Gotta I would say it. as a secondary, my second favorite beer is Delirium Tremens, which is pretty good. It's like a, I don't even know what it is. It's like a, some sort of strong beer. Sci-Fi Mike said, did the Blessed Virgin drink wine at its best a, at a little known wedding celebration? Of course she did. At the wedding in Cana, she would have drank wine. You know, it's interesting. St. Augustine, Holy Father Augustine, he was the... He was a Manichaean before he converted, right? And the Manichaeans were against all sensual pleasures. And so they, he was actually against drinking. And so he never had alcohol until he converted to Catholicism. And when he converted to Catholicism, he accepted alcohol. He still didn't like it because, you know, he had a disposition against it. But in order to avoid scandal and to show the goodness of wine— Obviously, he drank it at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, uh, but that's not wine. And the so one, at least once a year, 
he would have a celebration and he'd have the the faithful all around and he would make sure that he drank a glass of wine in full view of the faithful in order to show that he uh, was not a heretic in the rejecting uh, <laughs> alcohol and to show and to uh, show that there's the goodness of, of alcohol. Mm. Did he sip it really loudly? Like, <laughs> yeah, I actually have a audio recording. Pretty of good. It. Yeah. Oh, nice. I've, I've heard some historians suggest that in the first century, uh, wine was more drinkable than the water. Mm. Yeah, everything was. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, for if you were wealthy, you would have wine. Uh, so we talked about this yesterday. I'll release this this interview I did with my buddy Trevor uh, next week, and you can check it out. But we talked about the history of brewing, and he was like, yeah, the rich folk would have wine instead of water because the alcohol content made it clean, uh, which is why St. Dominic, he was actually forced to drink wine because he was wanted to do penance and only drink water. And he uh, was forced to drink wine because of his health. But he just would pour the wine into his water, so it was really gross wine. Um, but it was, uh, but it would sterilize the water. But oh, he said that yeah. the beer back then was probably about one to two percent for your like average person drinking beer because it was just to kill the bacteria. And children like would, drink, would drink the beer, like what ABV, ABV, one, right? One point two, yeah. uh, one or two, oh, one, one or, or two. two. And he said that, and and for celebrations, things like that, really the highest alcohol content you were getting would be probably like four percent uh so it was totally wow. different so people would you mm. see those people chugging down beers it's like that's totally different situation yeah like if we have a 10 percent uh abv uh An versus, IPA. yeah ipa <laughs> yeah. versus like the two percent one percent that people were probably having back then so petrus says we only drink sargris Prita? I don't know how to say that. Around here, it's a dark colored beer with a medium body and a pleasant caramel taste that sounds good I can do that. I like uh, Guinness. Um, yeah, I do. I do like Guinness. Oh, Guinness. Guinness. you know, because it's, yeah. it's uh, so it, it can also back up as a whole meal, right? Uh, having yeah. a Guinness, you know, if you're not uh, able to eat, you can always drink a Guinness, and you're probably topped off and good. But I hate to tell you, it actually mm. tastes better in, in Ireland. I you know how people say that, like, no doubt, no, because they have to. No, I believe it. They have it's to good. ship it across the 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 pond there with these like uh, little CO two cartridges built into the cans. Yeah, in order to give it uh, the same effect. Yeah, so it's I wouldn't I wouldn't be at all surprised to see that it tastes way better overseas. Uh, but for my um, bachelor party, I wouldn't allow crazy shenanigans, which is amazing oh, yeah. since I was a pagan at the time. Uh, but I, w I wouldn't allow my 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 guys to take me out to like a strip club or an, I wouldn't didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So we went to a bar and we just drank Guinness the nice. whole time. Nice. Yeah, that sounds fun. I like I like Guinness. Guinness is good. Uh, Master Baker said, have you heard the story of the Pope approving Bach beer for the monks that first brewed it? Yes. So this is a great story. I w we didn't talk about this yesterday. I wish we would have. So the these monks had brewed this beer, and it was apparently it was just like absolutely delicious beer, like just amazing. And so they were like, oh, it's Lent. We can't really drink this because it's so good. <laughs> Let's send it to the Pope and ask for permission to drink it. So they send it to the Pope, and it takes so long to get to, to the Pope and the travel, the change of weather, yada, yada, yada. The beer goes bad. And so the, it gets to the Pope, and the Pope tr drinks it to try it, and he, like, spits it out. Like, this is disgusting. Uh, you, yeah, y'all can drink this. No big deal. So he, they sent him back a letter saying, you can drink this. And, uh, and so they get it, and they're like, sweet, we got permission. And so they started drinking it. And, uh, but in reality, it was delicious beer. The Pope thought it was gross beer. So there you go, folks. Mm. Wow. <laughs> I'm exhausted now all of a sudden. I'm ready for uh, for a beer. Ready for <laughs> beer o'clock. <laughs> if, if I did a beer o'clock, I'd be like. <clears throat> I mean, it doesn't make much. I'll be like asleep fast. I rarely drink anymore. Yeah, I mean, same. I used to drink uh, a little more often. I was, uh, except for the time I was in the Marine Corps. Um, Why ever have a good day? Where you were you were expected to drink um, pretty much all day every day. Beyond that, I, you know, not really the biggest drinker. And nowadays, I rarely. I mean, it's a rare exception. I had some wine at the event that I spoke at this last week. Outside of that, just rare, very, very rare. Yeah, I'm a lightweight now. I just can't do it. I have to. I have to pace a beer for like an hour or two. That always gets to me. <laughs> Jay Coke, Marine Corps allowed drinking? <laughs> Weird. Right. <laughs> yeah, I thought. Yeah. I thought it was. Uh... I thought it was illegal in, um, in, in the Marines. San, it, well, when I went to when I went to combat school, it's in Camp Pendleton, um, which is not that far from 
a little town called Tijuana. Tijuana? You know, <laughs> in order to try to keep uh, young knuckleheads like myself at the time uh, from going down to Tijuana and getting into a lot more trouble, they would allow us to drink on base. <laughs> That's hilarious. So under 21, we were allowed to, you know, go to the go to the base pub. That's like the parent that's like, I don't mind if you drink, as long as you do it here at home. Yeah, or other things. Yikes. Yeah, so there you go. There you go. Hey, uh, like I said, uh, Monday is a special uh, show for 4th of, of July. And then, of course, on Tuesday, I think Jason Jones is going to be back in the Continental. Uh, hey. The 48, as we say, uh, coming back from Hawaii. And he's going to be on to uh, chime in about his thoughts and feelings post Roe v. Wade. And then, of course, catches up on some of his projects, uh, which he has. I think he was in Uganda not that long ago. I, I wonder what happened to his ambulance crew. Yeah. So let's ask because be they got attacked by a rocket or something. Yeah. So we're going to catch wild. up with him on Tuesday. And then we have a bunch of other shows. In fact, we're, we may get a, a fella on from, from Russia. I was watching this gentleman just yesterday talk about the effects of the Ukraine military campaign and the sanctions in Russia. And, uh, you know, he's he was able to admit that things are getting pretty, pretty dicey there. So we're going to have him on to talk about that. So hopefully that'll be all next week. Do us a favor and tune in. But if you're going to celebrate Fourth of July, praise be to God. Have a great weekend. Hopefully it's safe and good for your, you and your family. Uh, and we'll see you back here on Tuesday, I suppose. Do us a favor and do share us with a friend. And if you're not on the email list, I sent you an email yesterday with that uh, special little gem from Padre Pio. Make sure you jump on the email list and you'll get that in your inbox on Sunday. So to do that, just go to our website, grnonline.com forward slash CDT. That's grnonline.com forward slash CDT. Sign up for the CDT Insider email list and you'll get that in your inbox on Sunday. God bless you. God love you. Happy Fourth of July and we'll see you on Tuesday. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. I'll do it. It won't get done. If God don't do it. What up with that? Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. Come on, man. Come on, man. What are we talking about? Joe Brandon, I agree. <laughs> hey.